Hi, I'm Virginia with VJ Books. And today we're talking books. Part of our first series in sharing with you the first page, the first chapter, or the first portion of a book, we're handling David Rosenfeld's Who Let the Dog Out. I confess, I'm not one who likes to read series. John loves that, and he'll read one series book after another. I'm the kind of reader and collector that walks into my bookshelf and waits for the book to call to me. And for some reason, this book shouted out when I was wanting something to read. I liked it so much that I read three others within the series. I'll be reviewing this later on another video. We'll annotate this one to let you know when it's there. But for now, let me read to you from the flyleaf, give you a little background about the story, and then I'll read first portion of the book from David Rosenfeld's Who Let the Dog Out. He's a lawyer by day and then when, only when he's forced to take on new cases. But Andy Carpenter's true passion is the Terra Foundation, the dog rescue organization he runs with his friend, Willie Miller. So it's frightening when Willie calls him to say the alarm has gone off in the foundation building and there's clearly been a break in. It turns out that a recently rescued dog named Cheyenne, since her arrival at the foundation, has been stolen. Andy and Willie track the missing dog to a house in downtown Patterson, New Jersey, and sure enough, they find the dog standing right next to a dead body. The man had been gruesomely murdered mere minutes before Andy and Willie arrived. Could it be a coincidence? Or could it be the dog theft somehow is connected to the killing? Andy takes Cheyenne safely back to the foundation building. That should be the end of his involvement, but Andy's curiosity and his desire to keep the dog from further harm won't let him stop there. The cops have just arrested a man named Tommy Infante for the murder. But as Andy looks into the circumstances surrounding the break-in and the dog theft, he starts to wonder if Infante might actually be innocent. And when Andy takes Infante on as a client and starts searching in earnest for evidence that will exonerate him, Andy starts to discover terrifies him. The murder might just be one small cog in a plot with far-reaching implications. And unless Andy can undercover the truth in time, thousands of lives could be in imminent danger. Once again, David Rosenfeld has written a fast-paced and clever mystery with his characteristic blend of humor, larger-than-life characters, and propulsive plotting. Reading from the first portion of the book. This was not going to take a master thief. The difficulties of robberies, Jerry Downey knew, was directly proportional to the fear and expectation that the targets had of being robbed. No one goes to extremes to protect property unless they think someone might want to take that property. That's why banks and jewelry stores are tougher targets than hot dog stands and city dumps. That's robbery 101. That was why Downey, who over time had accumulated enough real world robbery credits to earn his masters, had no concerns about his current job. But that did not mean he was careless about it. He was a pro and knew it was the easy ones that could occasionally throw you a curve, which is why he had staked this one out for three days. After all, he was a professional and would act like one, despite the demeaning nature of this particular job. Of course, the job wasn't just demeaning, it was also strange. Downey had never stolen anything like this before and likely never would again. But if the payoff was always gonna be this good, he'd happily sign on for a repeat performance any time. The building was on Route 20 in Patterson, New Jersey, a heavily trafficked road that had a number of commercial businesses on it. Part of that time he'd been watching from a hamburger place across the road, which turned out to be a bearable because the burgers were charcoal broiled and damn good and french fries were crisp. The guy who ran the place he was watching, Willie Miller, left with his wife most days at around 5 o'clock in the evening sometimes a little later. The exact timing seemed to depend on whether they were there alone or whether a customer was on site. But far, so far, neither Willie nor anyone else had come back once they left, and Downey had watched until eight o'clock each night. Downey had gone inside the Target building the previous morning, pretending to be a customer himself. 
He needed to learn whether there was a burglar alarm, there was, and whether there were indoor cameras, there were, neither would cause him any concern. On this day, Miller and his wife didn't leave until 5.15, so Downey waited 20 minutes and then drove over. There was no reason not to do it in daylight. If for any reason anyone was watching, a car pulling up to that building would seem more natural then than at night. Besides, he would only be there a few minutes. Downey picked the lock in less than 10 seconds and went inside. He knew the silent alarm would be going off, but he'd be out long before anyone could respond. He pulled his jacket up over his head and headed for the electrical box to turn off the cameras. This was accomplished in a few seconds as well. The only thing that was annoying Downey at that moment, other than the indignity of having to do such an easy job, was the noise. The barking was deafening. He had no idea how Miller could stand it every day. Downey went directly to the dog runs, stopping at the fourth one on the right. Inside was a large dog matching the photo he had been given. He didn't know what kind it was and didn't care. Dogs didn't interest him one way or the other, and it amazed him how some people talked about them like they were human. He opened the cage, pulling the leash out of his pocket. The dog seemed friendly enough and not inclined to attack, which was a plus, since if Downey had to shoot her, it would have defeated the purpose of him being there. But her tail was wagging, and she came over and lowered her head as if she wanted Downey to pet her. That sure as hell wasn't going to happen, so Downey just put the leash on her and let her out. Downey took her to his car, and she hopped right in. The entire thing hadn't taken more than three minutes. A very profitable three minutes, at that. I'm Virginia with VJ Books. David Rosenfeltz, Who Let the Dog Out? We're talking books.